Hello and welcome. Hey, how's my audio? How's my video? Check these levels here. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. Mic. How's my mic levels there in the chat? All right. Okay. Let's return to a bit of music here. Hey, Ryan, welcome back. Welcome back. I appreciate uh, someone else's uh, streaming and is doing some of the same session prep stuff. Appreciate the feedback as well. All right. Hello and welcome. I think the audio is good there. Uh, get my camera going. It went to sleep on me. Yeah. Exciting stuff indeed. So welcome to session prep. I'm your game master, GM Ben. Um, and I, for the last stream, I'll get to introduce on this side. That's my co-host slash show mascot slash a uh, little piece of digital art, Paco, the D20 Mimic. Uh, maybe someday we'll get him animated. That'd be super cool. Uh, you know, we can dream. Um, I stream Odd Sundays at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. And you can catch me two weeks from today uh, for my third show, uh, Sunday, March 22nd. Uh, when, or sorry, that'll be Sunday, March 26th. When I'll be uh, talking about getting your players to leave town. I love that. I love that topic. Getting your players to leave town. That was suggested last week by uh, in the chat by Vomit Goblin. Um, and if you're uh, new to the show, uh, welcome. As I said, I'm here to help prepare your next session. Um, but first, monsters. Uh, today, uh, following the theme from uh, last week, uh, we're talking about even more monsters. Especially, as you can see on my... I uh, got my left and right mixed up. As you can see on my board there, um, uh, how to make the monsters match your heroes. And we might even, if depending on how the, how the stream goes, we might even make a new monster together. Uh, I've kind of got some ideas, but uh, we'll base it on what chat has to say. Um, if you're tuning in on Twitch, welcome. Feel free to ask any uh, DMing questions in the chat. Uh, I love when we get derailed with a little discussion. Like we last week, we talked about uh, Ooh Catastrophe from Tolkien and how like reversal in a fight makes the monster more memorable. Um, and uh, and of course, if you're watching it later on, perhaps on YouTube, uh, that's great too. Um, in either case, be sure to follow, be sure to like, be sure to subscribe. Uh, if you want to watch a show live and get notifications, follow Goodman Games on Twitch. Um, if you want to know, learn more about it, get more of my other content, follow me at GMBen on Twitter. I'm also on Twitch. I'll type a hello in the chat. I'm on Twitch as GMBen Show. Um, so this episode is all about uh, Monsters Part 2, and that's because Dungeon Denizens is currently live on Kickstarter. Uh, it's doing really well. It's Goodman Games' most successful Kickstarter to date by backer numbers. Um, we're going to get the link in chat for you uh, shortly, or I'll put it up. Um, and uh, it has 500 monsters for 5e in one book. It also has a second book or that you can get if you're a DCC fan. It's got a virtual tabletop back. It's got tokens. It's got the PDF. And I was the lead editor on the 5th edition side of things for that. So we're talking about monsters. We're talking about DMing. Um, and if you're watching this while the Kickstarter is live, uh, as I said last week, go check it out. Uh, if not, and you're watching this down the road, you can always check out Dungeon Denizens online or at your favorite local gaming store. Um, because I'm a uh, 5e editor, I'm going to be focusing on 5e in the stream, but not all of my streams were, will go, are going to be uh, about uh, um, 5e content. Uh, down the road, you know, for example, later in the year, I want to do two or three horror ones, which can be system neutral. So we'll just... We'll take it as we go. What's the link to the Kickstarter? Yeah, let me get that for you pretty quick. I actually, oh yeah, I've got it in my most recent, got it in my most recent visited web pages. It's exciting to see all the stuff there. Posting it in the chat for you. Um, and uh, um, but this year, or sorry, this stream, we're gonna be talking about fifth edition content more specifically because we're gonna be focused on monsters. Though some of it's gonna be useful to other role playing games, as you'll see as we get going. Of course, as a dun you know, giving dungeon master advice, I can answer questions that are a bit more uh, rules focused, 5e focused. I can answer questions that are a bit more uh, just general uh, DMing advice, how to deal with your players, that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, uh, I wanted to ask in, in chat, who was here for my last stream as well? Um, where we talked about, we talked last week about making monsters more uh, memorable, how to make them memorable in the lead up and the hook and the information, how to make them memorable during the fight. Uh, so if you were here last stream, give me a shout out. I recognize some of the names, Ryan, AO. Um, uh, D.W. Gable asks, Clerics, do they pick their spells or rolls? Not really specifying the core rules, but they are numbered. Uh, D.W. Gable, uh, that's a curious question. Where are they numbered? 
Um, no, absolutely. Clerics pick their spells, and not only that, they have a very powerful ability that they uh, re-pick their spells every long rest, which is a, a potent capability that allows them to solve problems uh, by sleeping on it, <laughs> if you will, which is why spells like Remove Curse, um, uh, Greater Restoration, Lesser Restoration, even if those aren't prepared for the day for the Cleric, they're a wonderful little arsenal uh, of spell to have for tomorrow. And as a Dungeon Master, you if you have a Cleric or Druid does the same thing in your party, you need to remember that uh, they have these spells available to them. They, you know, if there's a door that can only be unlocked um, because you have to heal the, the door. It's like you have a door golem, throwback to last week. And it can only be, uh, it'll only open if the players uh, remove an incredible splinter from it. Uh, Greater Restoration will remove it, and you know, worst comes to worst, the, the cleric will figure that out, can rest, and they can open the door tomorrow. Um, yeah, first timer here. Uh, says... Uh, flaming Drim Bui. Welcome, welcome. I love a Flaming Drim Bui. A good dream, buddy of mine. Love Drim Bui. Got me hooked on it for a while. Um, so, uh, we're talking about, uh, monsters. Uh, and making monsters match the heroes. Um, so the reason why I think this is a really, um, fun and interesting topic to discuss is because, uh, you know, in Dungeon Denizens, the, the book, uh, we've got you know, uh, I was gonna say a plethora. I think 500 is more than a plethora. We have every synonym for plethora, cornucopia, um, a host, a horde of monsters imaginable in that book. And we did our best uh, throughout um, to make them unique, interesting, innovative mechanics. Of course, um, you know, not to make them convoluted, there's still some really streamlined, interesting, kind of simple ones that accomplish what they're supposed to do without a lot of bells and whistles. But when we had the opportunity, we went for the bells and whistles by and large. The monsters that are really memorable. 20 Sides Every Story was in the uh, stream chat last week and said uh, that fighting each monster was a little bit like figuring out a puzzle at times. Uh, those were, of course, uh, some of the more elaborate monsters that we wanted uh, to play test and send along to 20 Sides Every Story. Um, but, uh, but when you're at the table, you don't need these uh, kind of uh, standardized monsters. You know, when we're designing Dungeon Denizens, we have to design them for every table. When you're picking a monster from Dungeon Denizens to use, or when you've got your, uh, you're designing your own monster, which is what we're going to be talking about today, uh, and you want it to hit the table, uh, you can customize it. You can make it match your adventure. You can make it match your players. Um, and it, we often say that when you're running homebrew, one of the real advantages is that you can customize your adventures to match your party. Uh, that's a topic that I'd love to dive into in a future stream. But you can customize your adventures to match your party. So why not customize your monsters to match your party? Why not adjust the monster to match the threat? Why not look at the ways that you can modify a monster to align or challenge uniquely match your party? Um, so I guess I wanted to start with asking chat, those of you that are here, we've got 11 people in the chat. That's excellent. Um, uh, what kind of uh i've got some ideas myself and uh, of course uh, as you those of you know the stream last uh, last week i can kind of run with the ideas or we can make this more interactive if i get some some good suggestions and ideas from the chat but um what uh what are ways maybe that you have changed a monster once you knew that your party was going to uh face it uh maybe you maybe you're making a new monster maybe you took one out of the monster manual uh you had uh uh the, the session coming up um, you know, maybe your, maybe your fighter was missing that week and you said, oh, I better change this a bit. Or, or maybe you just learned about a new spell that your warlock unlocked and you thought, ah, I can use that in this encounter. I'd love to hear if, uh, now or anytime in the next few minutes as well, when we're working, working through some ideas here, if any of the thing comes to you about how you've changed a monster to match your party, let us know in the chat. It'll give us some great ideas. It'll help the other dungeon masters, uh, figure things out. Uh, great. It's a great sort of tip. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, so making monsters ways that they can match your party, um, I kind of break them down myself to think about the different ways that you interact with monsters. And in each of those, uh, ways, there is a angle that you can modify the monster to match your party. So of course the, the first way, uh, ways to match. I was going to say number one, but we've got a, we've got a great tip from Ryan here. So uh, Ryan added some extra effects to a Black Dragon last week. Last week, just a recent session, love it. For instance, 
failing the breath weapon uh, took my 13th level party member's con save away. Whoa. Um, like he'll never succeed in another con save again. Never. Ooh, that's a real second edition kind of stuff. First edition. Uh, I love it. I love it. I mean, um, I as a I as a DM, and this will be a tip for uh, new DMs that are watching this. Uh, know your party before you do something outside of the rules that permanently modifies their character. Like we as uh, we as uh, at Games, as adventure writers, as monster designers, we kind of know that um, if we're going to, mm, let's say, mutilate a character, like uh, hit them with a brand new rule that really changes them, we kind of make it uh, have a duration of one adventure only. It's like a temporary curse. There's something they can overcome. Uh, and of course, Ryan knows uh, their party, so you got lots there. Uh, and 13th level should be challenging. There should be these kinds of fears. Um, but, uh, you know, as an example, if I were going to do this, and for just new DMs, DMs, if you're going to try it out before doing something permanent, think of, for example, we mentioned Greater Restoration earlier. Con saves go away. They'll fail every con save until they are a benefit from Greater Restoration. You know that your party doesn't have a cleric. You know they're not going to get that spell cast until they can meet with the Grand Vizier of the court uh, back in the city. You know they're stuck with that for the whole adventure until they uh, resolve that. But it's a devastating blow. Devastating blow. Um, but no, I, I love it. I, lo I love modifying characters in that way. Like, um, I, I tend to find um, your players will forgive you most for permanently changing their character when you let the dice decide. So, for example, if you say to them, there's this strange mutant goo in the fountain, and they see a rat drink from it and um, grow wings or something, and they see another one that's walking around missing and missing, like, uh, it's, it's uh, it, all its fur. So it's changing things in good and bad ways. When the players drink into that of their uh, the secret views, yeah, exactly, exactly, AO. Yeah, when the players drink into that of their own volition and they roll on a table, they, I think, will be much more forgiving of this dramatic change to their character because it was their decision. They kind of knew something that was going to happen and the dice dictate uh, what happened. Uh, player, yeah, if you're going to be mean to players, uh, put it to a dice roll. Uh, players will accept your their cruel fate much more when it comes from dice than when it comes from a DM. But uh, I know Ryan uh, knows their players. They had probably had a great curse there. Yeah, little little sidetrack. Don't mind those sorts of things. Love them on stream. Um, uh, changing, so um, Ryan changed the statistics, um, which I'll add to this list. I was going to do them a little bit in order. Because before we get to the statistics, there'll be other ways you'll encounter... Um, uh, the monsters. Uh, we talked about bit this a, a bit last stream, a little bit about this last stream. So, um, for example, you've got your monsters adventure hook. Uh, you've got the reason they're going to confront the monster. Um, and uh, Ryan gave us statistics as well, like changing, lump that all together. Um, changing a breath weapon. There's other things you can do with their statistics, and uh, honestly, there could be a whole stream focusing on that. We might spend a bit more time on statistics in the second half. Um, uh, and of course, we talked last week about statistics and lore, so let's put lore in there. The adventure hook, the lore, the statistics. Um, you know, I'm picturing an adventure hook uh, is one of the main ways to uh, modify your monster before the players encounter it. Like, if you've, um, if you've got, uh, an orc, uh, um, regiment of mercenaries that come, have come from far away and are here, uh, to, uh, um, uh, and are kind of, um, pillaging and stealing to support themselves, um, why not have them come from one of the regions where one of the characters are from? Uh, it's an adventure hook style thing. So why not have them have pillage the home village, uh, pillage the village. Uh, that should be a metal band name, honestly. Why not pillage the home village of one of the, um, uh, players, care, uh, villages, um, wh where one of the players comes from in their background. Uh, that's kind of the adventure hook modification. Um, yeah, AO says even how they look, their appearance and behavior. Oh, I love that one. Uh... Appearance, uh, such behavior. Yeah. Yeah, you could, uh, <laughs> is that an Iron Man? It's like, it might be. Uh, DW Gable, it might be. Um, yeah, appearance, behavior, you could say it's lower. It's definitely different. Match the appearance, behavior, uh, 
Ao, if when you have a moment, if you uh, want to type it up, uh, how would you, how would you modify a monster's appearance to match your party? Hmm, that's a that's a curious one. Uh, I could think of a I could think of a few ways. With with lore, I was thinking of you know, uh, for example, if um, if a character is uh, um, hunting for a certain rare spell, like you know that generic wizard motivation. Oh, I want more magic. Uh, you change the character's monster's lore. For example, Saruman's orcs are not born; they are uh, grown, and so you say, "Oh, the, these these orcs were grown by a white wizard." I mean, well, we can rip off Tolkien if we want. Why not? Um, these, you know, but that's a way that you've you've then taken something from a character, their hunt for spells, and you've twisted the monster that the, the there is some um, ancient ritual known to the white wizards that they are able to uh, grow the orcs uh, from the muck, abyssal muck, to create them. And then your wizard, who's always hunting for a unique spell, goes, Grow monsters out of abyssal muck. Um, I want that spell. Or something like that. Uh, other ways of lore as well. We can get to some more examples as we go. Uh, Ryan says, Sometimes I'll match a monster by either uh, hinting at a weakness, a priority uh, weak in whiz saves or something, or uh, using something that will allow a new character ability to particularly shine. Oh, yeah. And coming to my number three statistics. Absolutely. Um, I was thinking, um, you know, you could divide statistics uh, up, of course, matching the old monster sheet. You could be like, oh, AC, uh, attack rolls. But uh, ex exactly as Ryan was saying, um, strengths and weaknesses is, a, is uh, I think, an excellent way to divide it up. You could make the monster's strengths match the party, or you could make the monster's weaknesses match the party. Um, and it's, I, I love that suggestion. If you've got a new player at your table, that, uh, you know, Every other person has gotten the spotlight uh, several times. Uh, the new player has not gotten as much spotlight time. Um, the other people know that it's um, that you might be going soft with a new player because it's their first time. That's fair. They'll forgive you. Um, one of the ways to pass around that spotlight, uh, player spotlight being another. I had a great topic. Uh, 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 someone in the chat or an audience member suggested to me last week. Um, but uh, one of the ways to pass around that spotlight to a new player is make the monster that's weak to their statistics. Like, if you've got a druid uh, joining your group, uh, a lot of new players play druids for some reason. Um, uh, if you've got a new uh, druid in your group, maybe make um, kind of... Um, and you, oh, and you, you'd plan for the monster, for the characters to fight like a, uh, uh, a Remoraz, uh, which I might be pronouncing wrong, but like CR 9 or 11 or something, kind of flame, uh, like it's a centipede with like a fiery inside. Um, that's clearly a monstrosity, but um, if you know you're going to confront a druid, change the uh, Remoraz right there. Make it a uh, actually a giant centipede that swallowed some kind of flaming coal. Uh, that way your druid's beast abilities will kind of work on it a little bit more. It'll change the whole encounter because the druid can interact with it differently, and it will let that new druid character shine. Um, Ao says... Uh, Lore uh, in Nestera, the Cobble King of the Borderlands, is actually a shadow elf mutated baby by radiation. There's too much radiation from an old spaceship, no less. Oh yeah, love Nestera. It's a great old setting. Uh, and the shadow elves' underground home uh, that some of their offspring are mutated and they leave in outcast tunnels the same way the ancient Greeks fully left infant, infants on hillsides. So a cobble is actually a mutated shadow, for instance. Yeah, wonderful twist. Um, especially if you've got that sort of thing, just steal it for your own. It's you know it's out of an old second edition campaign setting, uh, which is uh, of course recreated from the. Uh, uh, the default starting world in um, uh, in a threshold in the original D and D, um, in some of the in some of the um, supplements. Um, if you've got you know uh, kind of a strange character race in your party, like let's say someone makes a, um, a sea elf or someone makes a uh, um, an Asimar that you don't normally have Asimars in your world, right? Then uh, you're going against this villain. We had this or the idea of an orc horde, very generic. But maybe you then twist it. The leader is not an orc, though he looks like an orc because of that abyssal sludge of the white wizards. Uh, the leader uh, is actually a corrupted uh, Asimar or uh, something that your party is. Kind of bring it together. Uh, great way to change type, change lore, uh, change those sorts of things. Uh, change the appearance even. Uh, I was thinking about that a bit. Appearance is a good one because it's the first thing your characters see. So uh, if you change the appearance to kind of match the uh, the characters, something you might change might be um, if one of the characters is hunting for gems, you kind of put a gem in its hide. Uh, if one of the characters 
Um, oh, an easy one. If you're facing some sort of, um, like, let's say you're facing a chimera, and one of the characters has kind of told you, oh, um, they'd really like kind of like the snow leopardy looking cloak. Make the chimera's lion body be snow leopard. Just appearance matches. Pardon me. Matches some of the things you know about your characters. Ryan says, maybe an enemy only speaks the language of one of the party members, or does so badly, they have to do their best to translate his intentions. Yeah, I like that as well. Uh, especially when we've got a new player, we were talking about Spotlight a bit. Uh, having it only uh, be the language of uh, the new player can be a neat way to put the spotlight on them. And it, language is an easy thing to change, uh, although we thought them when we forget. Um, I like to keep... My, my default fallback on fallback is that everything speaks common because it kind of means everyone at the party can be involved. But when you do that all the time, as, as I have actually recently, uh, you need to stop sometimes and mix it up, you know? Have that kind of dialogue where it can only speak to one of the characters. Uh, and then as a DM, you've got to watch that you're not uh, you're not doing that for one character constantly. Um, this kind of talking about... Um, uh, this kind of discussion of changing monsters to match the party kind of brings up the question of um, uh, balancing... Um, which of the characters you are matching your things to. Uh, it's the, the sharing the spotlight. You don't want to do it all for all for one or um, or find out you're doing it. Like if one character is a, is a language master, that's excellent. They should be one of the one of the language leaders. But if uh, if because they speak three extra languages, you know, draconic, um, Ab Abyssal and Primordial, and you're constantly fighting dragons, demons, and elementals, that's wonderful, but, you know, remember to bring in the Orc Horde for the character who speaks Orc. The Half-Orc, for example. Um, balancing which characters you are matching monsters to pass the spotlight around. Um, Ryan says, uh, it's part of doing two things, at least for combat. Yes, there's a fight, but also the enemy is trying to communicate something. Gives players decisions to make. Oh, I love that you made, uh, you came up with decisions. I think that's a, a topic that I should, uh, I should touch on, um, at a certain point. Um, can discuss it here. Uh, if you can make your monster give, make the players make a decision, um, that's a whole, that's a whole, uh, a sidetrack to go down. Um, uh, Ryan, if you have a question about decisions, we could tackle it a bit. Um, though I'd, I'd think more about it before I let a stream on, uh, giving the, giving the players difficult decisions to make. Um, Interesting twist, The Snow Leopard Chimera by Peter Matheson. Oh, yeah. Why not? Um, I think Peter uh, Matheson or Matheson wrote uh, The Snow Leopard, the um, nonfiction travelogue. Uh, interesting twist. Peter Matheson was a CIA agent when he wrote that into that. Um, but that's uh, the conspiracy theories aside. I think that's confirmed on Wikipedia. Um, uh, so when we're talking about balancing characters you are matching monsters to, uh, I had four here. Oh, one more. We were just talking about the snow. Ah, the snow leopard's cloak, the gemmed hide, uh, treasure. You know, treasure can be linked to appearance. They are carrying the treasure. Treasure can be linked to the adventure hook. It's the reason you're hunting for it. Um, the monster's treasure is a wonderful way to connect a monster to a specific party member. Um, and with treasure, I've got five here. Actually, I only started brainstorming four. I didn't realize it would come up with so many. Wonderful. With the five here, um, you, you know, let's say you have five characters in your party. You could, if you sat down with a check, check uh, list trying to uh, prepare for your session, you could, and this would, you can't do this every adventure, every monster. I don't think you could pull it off. Or you, But if you could do it uh, frequently throughout your adventures, you know, put one player uh, in each category. Player A, B, C, D, E. Try and mix it up. You know, you're planning an adventure, you're planning your monsters. Uh, maybe you've got a monster that has the, the, the Orc Horde, you know, has pillaged one of the character's villages. Um, that's in the adventure hook. Um, but the the lore is that they are made from a spell that the wizard is hunting for. And the treasure is that they are wielding um, a, uh, a certain type of uh, dangerous hooked sword. Uh, just stealing, just stealing willy nilly from Lord of the Rings. And your fighter says, does that sword have different statistics? I want that as a treasure. Give me a common magic item that is, you know, somehow a sword that has advantage on my Battlemaster maneuver trip attack. Or give, sorry, that would be giving disadvantage on your trip attack. Why not? Do it. A uh, sword that gives advantage on the shove attack. Um, little common treasure. So you've just gotten this one monster uh, grouping, the, the Orc Horde stolen from Lord of the Rings. We've modified them in five different ways. Why not have each of those connect 
to a different character in your party. Uh, give everyone a little link. Um, if if ever your players saw uh, like how cleanly you had done that, uh, it might reveal some of the old artifice of Dungeons and Dragons. It might be like, why why is it that e literally each of us has a unique connection to this monster? So you don't need to for every monster uh, have a specific connection for every character. But dividing it up works great. Balancing uh, around uh, if you've if you've left one party out for a while, be careful there. Um, yeah. Uh, those are some of the ways that I had brainstormed and we've brainstormed together that you can kind of modify a monster to, uh, match the statistics. Um, I was also thinking, um, here, uh, but what can we look at? Uh, what can we look at in a character? Uh, and we've talked about some of them, but let's just, we can put a list on the old uh, document here. What can you look at in your players to get ideas? for modifying. And if anyone in the chat wants to um, jump in with um, what you could look at in a player, what you might see in your player, some of the stuff we've covered, uh, I'm just going to quickly throw some of these ideas into our, our document for people that come late. So if I tear off the sheet, they can see what we've got going on here. Um, Backstory motivation says AO. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, and um, the next, of course, uh, we'll look at um, um, what what in your uh, characters. Uh, can you match monsters to? Sometimes overlook age. Oh yeah, like um, I can I can brainstorm. Twenty sides every story. Welcome to the chat. By the way, everyone, if you're new to the stream, check out Twenty Sides Every Stories uh, Twitch stream. They've got uh, great live play there. Um, uh, age, I'll give you, I'll give you one AO. Um, if you've got an older character, like an old man, a character in your party or uh, an older person, uh, as a character, um, and a ghost comes along that can age them with an attack, that will, uh, put the fear of death into that character so viscerally. Uh, it's an excellent one. The, a little joke that they thought was a good gag. Oh, I'm gonna play the old man at the table when my character tries to walk along. And it's, um, you know, it's, uh, a little bit, a little bit ageist stereotype. And then suddenly a ghost comes along that can just age a character, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, t uh, 10 to 30 years. That's frightening if your character is already a senior citizen. Um, uh, and speaking of which, uh, I, think, I think I can push this up and uh, we can write along the bottom here. Um, yeah, so we got uh, the ba L backstory. Um, we got matching two characters. Uh, AO says backstory and um, and motivations. I think those are both great. Not quite the same, um, so they don't need to be the same. Think of them differently. Um, look at your character's backstory. Uh, where do they come from? Is there a monster that can come have come from there? When you know when you're making a monster or changing a monster, uh, is it is it in a you know? If your character has deceased parents, as many of the orphans at our tables do, uh, bless their little orphan hearts, um, what killed their parents? Uh, oh, they think it was, uh, they went with something simple, a marauding orc horde. They thought it was a marauding orc horde. Uh, turns out it was a ghost orc horde. Orc horde. Um, you, you need to connect them to the ghost adventure? Uh, slip in a twist. They discover that it wasn't orcs at all. It was a ghost. Um... I turn it around the monster. AO says turn around, make the monster their long lost or presumed dead parent. Yeah, absolutely you could. Absolutely. Uh why not? Uh you get to the end of the adventure. Um although uh I will caution DMs against uh you know, one of the reasons we play like D, &D uh, can have a whole number of motivations and um uh for play and people love a wide variety of way of things out of the game. Um but a lot of people come to the table to roll dice. And you got to be careful that your twist doesn't take away some satisfying moment that the characters were hunting for. So if they're hoping for a big bad fight, uh, may, don't don't reveal that the monster is their parent 
at the beginning of it, like before the fight breaks out and just totally subverts, like, you know, the other four characters were hoping for this role initiative. Do it in the middle of the fight, you know? Uh, Ryan, oh, there you go, Ryan brought up, uh, make, have difficult, have your priority, have the characters make difficult decisions. What's a difficult decision? Uh, you're fighting a dragon and you discover that it was actually the Dragonborn's parent because it was Polymorph, or it was actually the, um, uh, the Half-Elf's parent because it was in Elven form. Just twist it right around. Absolutely. Ryan says an enemy might be after something the players are carrying, the magic sword MacGuffin. For some reason, the spiders are drawn to it. Oh, that's good. Um, uh, yeah. So the, the characters' items. Uh, look at their items. Maybe uh, they they hunger for it. Maybe the characters are carrying something that the monster wants to eat. Like we've got that typical story in um, uh, a lot, in a lot of fairy tales that the characters are carrying fresh meat, and some grotesque monster wants to eat it. Uh, but you can also have the monster be hungry for other things characters say are, are carrying. Like, for example, the rust monster very typically, uh, wants to eat, uh, the character's, um, uh, metal items. Borrow that and twist it. Um, maybe you've got a new monster that likes to eat gems, the Zorn. Maybe you've got a new monster that likes to eat magic items. That was an older one. I can't remember what monster ate magic items. Just something in second edition. They, <laughs> they took out the, uh, the frequency with which players had their items destroyed because it caused a lot of fights at the gaming table, I think, uh, among, especially among teenage players. Uh, uh, maybe they're hungry for halflings. <laughs> hungry for halflings, also an excellent metal band name. Uh, that's our meme of the, uh, the episode today. Uh, d d references to metal band names. Um, so we have backstory, we have motivations, we have items. Um, uh, of course, uh, an easy one would be uh, class abilities, spells. Um, you got class abilities, you got spells. Um, you know, maybe uh, if you've got a character that throws around fire, you got to be pretty cleanly aware. Of course, using random monster tables can help it be fairer, can help uh, um, uh, mix that up a little bit in, in ways that it doesn't seem like you're out to get the player. But if you've got a player that is specialized in fire, then you're cleanly aware uh, every time you're picking a monster that if you make it vulnerable to fire, that player's going to shine. If you make it resistant to fire, that player's going to take a back seat. And you do have to throw those in the mix. It's only fair and common in the game, but you, uh, you should be aware when you're doing it because it's a spotlight factor. Uh, it's going to reveal that that monster is better connected to the characters. If you know the energy types that the characters are using, beware of resistance, beware of vulnerability. Um, similarly, the cleric's powers are very monster specific. Uh, the ability to turn undead, often necrotic and radiant damage, be aware of those. Um, think about them if you, it's time to spread the spotlight to one of the characters. Um, there is also, uh, uh, you know, the ranger class has gone through some revisions uh, with the Tasha's variant, um, some on Earth Arcana that I've seen at the table as well. Um, but monsters, uh, rangers specialize in a certain type of monster. That's a class ability right there that you should be aware of and you can twist a monster to meet that, you know? If your ranger hunts uh, giants and you're planning for them to fight kind of monstrosities, uh, there's no reason that tentacle being can't have arms and a limb and it's actually a type of giant now uh, to give your ranger a little bit more of that connection that they weren't expecting in that adventure of aberration fighting, perhaps. Um, what else do we have here? Background, motivations... The things the characters want. That's an excellent one. Um, worth looking at uh, as an example. If you know specifically what your characters are hunting for, looking for, if you've asked them, what do you want out of adventuring? Uh, we had the example of the wizard that wants um, spells in the previous uh, uh, um, analysis of, of how we can modify the monsters. Uh, if you know what your characters want, it's an excellent thing to give to your uh, monsters. Uh, there's the twist. The ranger with cobbles of favorite enemy can't touch the cobbled king. Yeah, you don't realize till the battle happens. That's an hon honestly, it's a great way to match the monster to the ranger, uh, because they're the only one that figures it out. Suddenly, their extra attack doesn't work. They're a little annoyed, but you slip them a note, you whisper it to them, you tell them direct that they're the only one with this uh, secret knowledge about the cobbled king that he must not actually be a cobbled. They're gonna love it. It's it takes something away, but it gives something back. And uh, when you can do that, when you can do that with a twist that it takes and it also gives, uh, it's gonna be a richer twist. Um, so we've got some different things you can have, um, 
And I really like um, uh, Ryan's suggestion of forcing difficult decisions, but um, uh, that's a hard one to sum up. So maybe that'll just be a topic for a future uh, stream. We've got several of them going on in this discussion. Um, uh, with that in mind, I think maybe we could try and make a monster together. We can use some of these ideas. We can make a custom monster. Uh, I'm going to throw some of these ideas onto uh, my... Am I pointing at it? My good copy. There we go. On the other side of the screen. And um, uh, uh, while I do, I'm wondering if uh, anyone in the chat uh, wants to tell us about a player. Uh, I should say not a player. A character in their party. Tell us about one of the heroes. Because we can make a monster to match your heroes. I would say, um, you know, if you describe the whole party, that could eat up a lot of typing time, eat up the chat. Um, we wouldn't be able to match that many characters. But um, give me, give me some of the characters that uh, that are that you're currently DMing for. Um, we can make a monster to match them. We can pretend if you each give me one character, uh, we can pretend that's a party, and we can modify a monster uh, or make a monster, I should say, to uh, to satisfy those characters or to to hook them and to uh, engage them. Um, I guess you could tell me, you know, the level class. We can work with statistics abilities. Um, you could tell me their backstory a little bit. Uh, what, what, you could tell me any of these things in this list. What is their motivation? What special items they have? Just one or two things that stand out that is great material that we can make a monster around. Um, uh, put this on the chat here. What about your characters? Can you match monsters to? Oh, we can match it to their backstory. We can match it to their motivations. Uh, their items. Uh, their class abilities. Really, that's just all abilities. Uh, class abilities, spells. Uh, put that in. <laughs> you don't have any heroes in your party, just mass murderers and war criminals. Uh, uh, it's way more common than we all realize. Yes. Uh, uh. Ooh, Ryan uh, Ryan has a Shadow Paladin player who lost his con save to a dragon. Ooh, I like it. That'll be some great material here, too. Uh, I'm going to rip off a extra sheet of paper here to move forward. Get my die 20 back in the chat so if anyone sees the uh in the thumbnail so if anyone sees the thumbnail they'll they'll know what we're doing here we're rolling dice don't need to roll dice nice little addition to the stream we got dice we can roll them if we want we can do something random um Titani mario says party members are just murder hobos <laughs> yeah it happens it happens but i would honestly say less than we think the joke is that they're murder hobos uh, the reality is that even murder hobos uh, have a soft spot in their heart for something, and uh, you can bring it up at the table. You can find, you can give them difficult decisions. Even a murder hobo can be confronted by difficult decisions. Uh, however, murder hobos, I would say, are some of the easiest to modify monsters for. They're so passionate about combat, they wear their fighting abilities on their sleeve, and that's where you can use the statistics a lot. Brian says, I haven't tried yet, but I'm curious to put them in a situation with an enemy that can cast light and challenge their mobility. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if they, uh, uh Ryan, uh, I'll, I'll add that one to our party. This is our, this is our party. We're going to have, uh, whatever characters you give me, this is our party. We have a shadow, uh, paladin. Uh, currently no con saves. Uh, let's keep that in mind when we're making a monster. Shadow paladin has no con saves. Uh, and can jump through shadows. Uh... Love it. Oh, my brain is firing with the ways that can make an incredibly interesting monster. Uh, using light? Yes, please. How can they use light? We'll figure it out. Um, Ao says, I'd love to DM for party of valiant but hungry halflings torn by the desire uh, for the great weight they're carrying. Uh, uh, it's, I think I've seen that movie, actually. Um, yeah, your murder hobo meets a ghost who's a dead parent. Uh, you killed me. You killed me, son. Absolutely. Um uh you know even uh it's it's honestly a very shakespearean hamlet moment if you uh the murder hobo meets a ghost their dead parent like are you giving your you're giving your orphan murder hobo one of the uh opportunities for one of the best dramatic monologues uh of all time 
And this is this is a little aside. Uh, well, if anyone else in the chat uh, wants to um, let us know what one of their uh, one of the the players, uh, one of the yeah one of the characters that they're dungeon mastering for, so we can make some monsters based on them. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna make a really cool monster for um, Ryan's Shadow Paladin. Um, uh, 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 Durthin, welcome. Uh, welcome. Um, uh, yeah, Durthin, I you might be able to just rewind and put it on double speed. Otherwise, we got uh, the extra info. Eh, wrong side on the left hand side there. Um, yeah, when it, uh, if you've got a murder hobo and you, uh, you want to, um, rein them in a little bit, or, no, rein them in is the wrong word, they love murder hoboing, I mean, give them opportunities to do it, but you want to show them the other ways that they can really enjoy the game of Dungeons and Dragons, um, do a moment, for example, where you kind of freeze frame, I was saying, uh, before that when you're in initiative is a great time, but also around the campfire, also, when you're speaking to a neutral kind of villain, uh, any moment you can think of, uh, bring up a question, brainstorm these questions in advance, and ask your murder hobo uh, to answer the question. Their character might need to answer it out loud. For example, if the innkeeper says, why'd you come to town? Or if uh, the villain says, uh, what do you get by slaying me? Um, of course, you know, you froze an initiative, it's the, it's the bad guy's turn, and he's losing, he says, what do you get by saying me, uh, slaying me? And then that's, uh, that's something that the, uh, uh, the, uh, murder hobo would have to answer out loud. It could also be a question that they think about the answer to, like, for example, if one of the other players who, uh, is conversing with the, the villain, and the villain asks them a question, say, uh, even though you don't all speak out loud, all of you are thinking about the answer to this question. In that moment, offer the murder hobo inspiration if they uh, respond to it. Uh, offer the, say to the, say to that character who loves combat, because inspiration is very potent, especially if you allow it as a reroll instead of a advantage in advance, as a lot of Dungeon Masters do. Offer that murder hobo, say, um, the ghost is actually the ghost of your dead parent. What do you say to them? Uh, take a moment, I'll give you inspiration uh, if you tell us what you say to your dead father. And then you've got Shakespearean Hamlet speeches coming out of your murder homos. Why not? It'll work, I promise. Uh, Durthin's got a character for our, par our party. So one of our members is the Shadow Paladin with no con saves. You can jump through shadows. The other one is a Cleric Bird Watcher. What an excellent party. Cleric Bird Watcher um, who uh, logs monsters. Yeah, kind of a... Oh, uh, I see. Like, he's based on a bird watcher. He's a monster watcher. Uh, a monster bird watcher. Love it. Not really birds, but I get what you're saying. Uh, uh, only ever helps the party. Uh, he doesn't like attacking. Doesn't like attacking. Uh, something to be aware of when you're customizing a monster for a party is... Um, we could take more Vitani Maru if you've got one. Um, I think, given the time that we're at, I think three is appropriate. So, if you've got one more. Uh, helper doesn't like attacking. Helper doesn't like attacking. Um, that's a, a something to be aware of when you're uh, trying to brainstorm a monster custom for that, is uh, do you want to lean into that and let them be that, or do you want to challenge that and provoke that? Um, this is something that I was thinking I might have gotten to in the last little section, but um, I'll add it now to our little, um, where's my left-hand side? I'll add it now to our little messaging chat. Um, uh, this is, five, you know, five. This is like a bonus one. Um, the, uh, to make it an opposite or an antithesis. Make the monster the opposite of the player, uh, the character. Make it fully uh, the reverse. That is something that, that's like the, you know, the foil in comedy or in, or in um, script writing. The opposite lets the character be who they want to be, brings them out more. So this helper who doesn't like attacking, if they confront their opposite, if they confront truly like a, a, a rage uh, lusting um, a blood berserker, uh, the helper is going to have to face a difficult decision, which Ryan brought up, great thing to face as a character. Face, you can face monsters, but why face monsters? You can face difficult decisions. Um, they're going to face a uh, uh, this, you know, bloodlusting rage berserker who is only loves attacking. 
And when they face that, they'll have to reach the decision, you know, is this the moment that I attack and help the party? Or does this show that even in the face of such vile aggression, I am still not going to strike? Uh, that's how you can kind of give them a difficult decision. Uh, and we got our third character from Vitani Maru. Uh, Hanta one Tiefling Sorcerer who opened a book of forbidden knowledge, which is how they gained their wild magic. Ooh, I love wild magic. Hanta one because she immediately cast a fireball herself because of the book and <laughs> burning killed her family. <laughs> I hope that happened at the table instead of in the backstory. Otherwise, we get another orphan, but no, uh, that's great. I love it. Um, Haunted one Tiefling. Uh, a Haunted Tiefling. Um... Wild Magic Sorcerer. Because of... Uh, because of a book. Book of Forbidden Knowledge. I like that. Uh, what I love about that, reminding these characters for moments that we can use in a monster. And uh, and you could apply some of the same wisdom to designing your adventures, to be honest. Designing your encounters. Uh, but we're going to use it as a monster. To make a brand new monster here. Um, they, they have the Book of Forbidden Knowledge as the source of their wild magic. If there's another book of forbidden knowledge, will the wild magic sorcerer open it, or will they uh, resist because it killed their family? And ooh, difficult decision. Open the book, possibility of more magic. Leave the book closed, my party lives and I live. Mm, it's a real toss-up. It's a real toss-up. That's uh, 100% what happened. Well, families lose. She killed the party with the fireball. Yes, love it. Uh, when he was down next to her, she ran over to save him. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad that happened at the table, Vitani. I'm glad that happened at the table. Um, Book of Forbidden uh, Knowledge is the source of their power. All right, we've got a cool party. We've got three characters that uh, we can use. Um, I'm kind of now thinking, what kind of monster can we create out of this? Um, well, I can say first off... Um, I won't type any of this into our uh, chat. I don't or into our document. I don't think it's necessary. Um, but I can say a couple of rules. Let's make it tier one. Um, make it tier one monster. We may not get full statistics, but tier one helps us um, because a lot of parties are tier one. It's great to practice with that. And specifically, let's make the tier mon tier one monster like tr uh, kind of six. That way, it's kind of an end game. Um, you can uh, first little party if they're prepared can try and confront a CR six. It will be a challenge, but before they get to it, they'll probably reach level six, second, level third, and then the CR six monster with a couple minions is an excellent challenge. If they get all the way to level six, it's going to need to be bumped. It's going to need a few more minions, but even at level four, a CR six uh, with a minion or two is a great, great encounter. Uh, the Mario is a running joke. They're only allowed to play a wild magic social. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah, I mean, wild magic sorcerers are a, a, a joy and a challenge at the table. It depends on your dungeon master. They really gave a lot of, um, they really gave a, gave a lot of power to the dungeon master on that one. But the wild magic table is so absurd that, uh, I, I don't fault Wizards of the Coast for that decision that the dungeon master that, um, procs the table, uh, don't fault them for that. It kind of makes sense. It can be a little bit underwhelming as a, as a build, though, if your dungeon master doesn't do it for you. Um, so, um, Let's go with, uh, uh, let's go with these difficult, um, decisions, um, that I was, we're already brainstorming it. Let's go with some difficult decisions here. Um, the monster is some sort of, uh, bloodlust creature. Uh, the monster has a bloodlust. And, um, forbidden knowledge... Forbidden knowledge. Um, the monster is tattooed with uh, uh, wild magic spells. Why not? Tattooed with wild magic. Uh, there is literal forbidden knowledge imbuing its body. Um, uh, I'm open to a chat. If anyone has a suggestion for um if this is a uh what type of, if this is a giant i'm kind of picturing some sort of strange giant or if this is a uh aberration uh i'm or if this is a humanoid um i uh i don't mind the suggestions if anyone wants to jump in with some of that uh some of the the filler between this uh um, it's a minotaur yeah there than yeah it is <laughs> we got a unique we got this this is um like a uh, a spellbound minotaur or something 
is the monster we are dealing with. Um, first example, first first guest, I love it. Spellbound Minotaur. Uh, Ryan says, I see two mentions of the books of knowledge for what's been made. It's like looking at a basilisk where it might be to make save against forgetting and losing. Ooh, yeah, why not? And why not? Ryan, you're doing my job for me. Check out Ryan's stream, by the way, uh, everyone. Ryan uh, also streams a session prep show over on uh, Ryan Immel PM uh, on Twitch. Um, yeah, this is exactly a great power. So the um, the Cleric Bird Watcher logs monsters. So we want the Minotaur to be unique. It's not just a tattoo to Minotaur. The tattoos, and I guess this would be the real question mark for your old Cleric. Um, does it... Uh, oh, yeah, thank you, Ryan. Uh, does the Cleric um, know that it's just a Minotaur warped by spells? Or is that question, is it just a Minotaur warped by spells? Or is it some new beast that may provoke the, the Cleric into hooking that Cleric a little bit? So we've got we've got a so let's let's uh let's make it size huge. Why not? Why stop at large? Let's make the spellbound has made this thing immense. Uh um Ooh, Curious Onlookers gives us a good one. Curious yeah, absolutely. Uh the uh the, uh, whatever, wherever this, uh, Minotaur has this knowledge, we were, you know, one of the things we were thinking of was the tattoos, um, uh, or it's, um, other, other, like, if it has a book, um, uh, anything it steals from the characters, uh, uh, you, after all saving is losing free knowledge, and that knowledge is encased on it. Uh, Ryan and Curious Onlookers, because I love that, because, um, then when you defeat the monster, you're gonna get it back. Um, uh, so... I might have to use my uh, next page here in our uh, chat or in our good copy um, because we have some, we now have some info for this. Um, we've got a spell uh, bound Minotaur. Um, no, it's called a spell rage Minotaur because uh, it's not bound by anything. Uh, we don't need the monster statistics here to do this. Um, we got a spell rage Minotaur. Um, And we know that it's huge. I'm not going to write out this monster with a full uh, full stat block, but we'll brainstorm some things. We know that it's size huge, um, uh, thus uh, provoking the cleric to know that it is whether it is a uh, um, truly frightening uh, uh, a new creature or modified by the spells. Um, we know that its uh, its hide is tattooed by a wild magic, um, and. Uh, we know that it uh, uh, lusts for blood uh, yeah. and murder. The ultimate murder hobo is thrown back at your players. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so we've got some brainstorm here. Ryan has a less intense version. May it change your knowledge. I don't spell you know for this fight only. Reroll a new random one. I still spell you know. That's a good one because if you take it away, it's just like it was cast. You can truly just irrevocably take away the quote, highest all spell slot, because the character gets it back on a short or long rest, depending if they're a warlock or wizard. Um, you, uh, AO says, you don't exactly get it back, though, do you? Then you remember reading deals of the book. That, too, we still don't remember the original instance. The same way we might remember a photo of child, not the event. Yep, they both get back, exchange spells. Dirthen says, well, if it's displaced and out of its element, you would think the bird watcher is bound to have to remove it from this environment. Uh, yeah, if the it comes from somewhere else, it has arrived. Um... We got some um, great things here. I want to I want to add. Uh, uh, so it is going to charge at you, right? Like if we start with the minute, and honestly, I'm not going to get into the statistics here in this stream. Um, although uh, it could be a future stream, you know, I prepped a little thing. We could have written a monster statistics if that made sense to do. But we're focusing on the abilities here. So focusing on the abilities, it makes sense um, that it's it's going to use. We're going to start with statistics of the Minotaur. And always start with, uh, you know, like, why why reinvent the wheel? You know, pick a monster that's already close to the challenge rating you're going for, um, or the exact challenge rating, and then start taking away in order to add, and port it over. So if we go with the Minotaur, we know it's going to charge, we know it's going to get up close. So we could uh, we could give it the um, uh, the Spell Wipe ability, um, or Spell Steal. Um, oh, I like stealing it. Um, because then you know that all of the, that is how the, the Haunted Tiefling will know that all the spells on its body are something that it has taken from elsewhere where it has been. So it has a spell steal ability that something like, um, each, uh, creature that starts its, uh, its turn within 
10 feet of the Minotaur. Of course, this is a Spell Rage Minotaur, a little different. Uh, we can even come up with a unique name for it. Uh, we could make it not a Minotaur, but give it like the head of a Yak or uh, or the head of a Rhinoceros, uh, if everyone wanted, just to kind of tell the players this is clearly a different creature. Um, each creature that starts this turn, creature meaning character here, each creature that starts this turn within 10 feet of the Minotaur, um, must make a... Uh, uh, and like a Basilisk, um, we can just steal that text from the Basilisk and avert uh, eyes like Basilisk. Um, must make a Wisdom saving throw uh, or lose its highest level um, spell. Um, known spell. Let's do that. Let's not take away slots. Known or prepared spell. That spell uh, becomes tattooed on the Minotaur. Um, Wisdom save. What's the DC? What's the DC? You're making a new monster. Uh, what's the DC? Um, there's a great chart in the Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, CR, Challenge Rated by CR. Also check um, similar monsters. Um, you know, you can look up what another monster has for DC. There's a little formula you can do, but um, the formula is not that important. The character, your players never see the formula. We made sure to be very consistent in, of course, Dungeon Denizens, but when you're designing design of your own table, pick something that makes sense. You know your character's wisdom saving throw bonuses. Um, oh, no, Shadow Paladin? I got a better chance, decision. It's going to be a constitution saving throw. Uh, Shadow Paladin automatically fails Constitution saving throws. We've left out the Shadow Paladin. Automatically fails Constitution saving throws. Uh, you're gonna make it be a Constitution saving throw as it, their body, oh, and they take damage. Just give it damage. Uh, uh, and take, uh, uh, it physically rips the spell out of them, and it is the creature's own blood that will implant the spell onto the body of the Minotaur. Um, I think that is a, a great, a great addition. I missed, I missed some things that were in chat there, um, but I think there were some great suggestions, uh, that can be used and can apply. Um, uh, yeah, we could, um, we could take away, of course, some memories from the party, but that's a little that's a little tricky, and that'd be a longer topic to get into. How how do you take away memories? Uh, I've done it once or twice. Again, False Hydra, if you know what I'm talking about. Wink, wink. If you don't, and you're a Dungeon Master, do look it up. Um, Curious Onlinger says, just flare-wise, what if the Minotaur is partly flayed, and you recognize it as the vellum from the book? Yes, uh, yes, its skin is the book in the Haunted Tiefling Red. Yeah, love it. Uh, absolutely love it. Um... Uh, explains a bunch of stolen spells got in there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we're, uh, we're kind of, um, <laughs> Ryan's here for the False Hydra chat whenever you have it. Yes, that would be a Dungeon Masters only chat, Ryan, whenever we have that one. Oh, that'll be a good one. Let's uh, make another note of that. Do the False Hydra stream. Uh, no, that's a rich, that's a rich, rich topic with a rich stream. Um, we're, uh, we're, we got, a, we got more time in the stream, but not a whole lot more, so I do just want to wrap up this Minotaur. Um, I'm thinking, um, uh, spell steal. What happens when they steal the spell? That's the frightening part. It's, there's spells tattooed on the Minotaur. Um, I don't, personally, I don't want to trigger the wild magic table in this fight. If you want to run a bit more of a Looney Tunes style game, then trigger your wild magic table once around. Go for it. Um, but we've got this bloodlusting Minotaur that literally rips skin off creatures and blood off creatures' body, part reflays itself with a work. This is this is some real heavy metal uh, late night cartoon style campaign. Uh, gets the spells onto themselves. Uh, obviously, you should design monsters for your party. Do not design this monster for. Uh, for uh, a bunch of seven or eight year olds. However, I think 13 year olds would love it. Go go right ahead with 13 year olds. Blood and Gore uh, Galore, why not? Blood and Gore Galore, also a great metal band name, meme of the episode. Um, what do they do with the spells? You've got these spells uh, on the Minotaur. Um, I will say, uh, um, if you give, if your Minotaur CR6 has only one attack, it's kind of horns attack or a horn or a claw. Like its horn is better for charging. Its claws, once it does, once it's in battle, you give it only one attack. You can also, uh, maybe it cast a spell and perhaps it travels through the air. Yeah, you can also have it casting a spell every round. If you give it just that one attack, 
a CR6 monster, you know, if you look at comparable monsters, uh, I can remember the elementals stand clearly in my mind uh, as a CR5, and they have like two 15 damage swings. So if you give the uh, monster, uh, Mon Minotaur uh, just a single 15 damage swing, then you can say, uh, um, I don't know what you call it, uh, Bloodcast or something. Uh, as a bonus action, the Minotaur uh, casts one of the spells uh, it has tattooed on itself. Why bonus action? Because this monster is only going to survive three rounds. Don't make it give up its horns or claws to cast a spell. Um, uh, Ryan suggests healing itself. I would push against a monster healing itself. Uh, I've said this several times, um, in, not in stream actually, um, but if uh, uh, if you if you want a monster to be more dangerous, don't increase its hit points, don't heal it, up its damage. I'll always push this. Um, don't turn a fight into a slug. Uh, a tr uh, you know, a troll's regeneration is a unique trait. Um, but other than that, and we were very cautious of this in Dungeon, in Dungeon Denizens, very cautious of when we gave monsters healing powers. Regeneration, you know, it's a it's a it's a, a fun finicky one. Um, but beyond that, uh, when a monster is clearly losing, uh, regeneration just delays their defeat. You need an ability that is going to switch loss to maybe they're going to win. Raise the stakes. And that's why um, I would stick... I mean, if they steal a healing spell, they can cast it. They can heal themselves. Um, you obviously want to get your character back from the Minotaur before it casts this. Um, but if you... Uh, uh, a spell rage Minotaur like the Minotaur of Min Minos uh, has a perfect memory and remembers everything it's encountered. Perfect. I mean, uh, this is how it remembers all the spells. It's it's Its skin is its memory of spells. It, it, wear, it literally wears its memory on its shoulder, so to speak. Um... So whatever spell it gets, it can cast. I wouldn't default to healing because, uh, but I would default to a, uh, a fireballs. That's a great one. Um, uh, so we've got, we've, uh, we've started with these characters. We focused more on their lore and their nature and their, um, uh, uh, and their other abilities. Um, Ryan says, what if you uh, have to hit it in fresh ways? Seizure attack, it can perfectly counter it. Ryan, I will tell you, uh, if you love that idea, uh, you know, a little bit inspired by the, say, the Borg out of Star Trek with their um, adaptive um, phaser resistance, but um, uh, there is a mirror ooze that I designed for Dungeon Denizens that I think will be in the book, that it has an adaptive resistance and has a reactive attack that strikes back, um, kind of like the, uh, the Terminator uh, made of the uh, molten metal. The mirror ooze uh, takes resistances and simultaneously lashes out with the same flame or blade that struck for it. If you like that, do check it out in Dungeons and Dungeons. That's one of my designs. Um, my party has faced it uh, more than once. Uh, I can confirm. Um, the thingy, Mr. Freeze in the Batman games. Oh, I know Mr. Freeze from the uh, Batman and Robin. Don't know from the games. Um, yeah, so um, I, I want to add for the Shadow Paladin. Um, can jump through shadows. Uh, we, we ought to have some little effect here, like, uh, um, uh, whenever the Minotaur casts the spell that is on it as a bonus action, maybe once, once per spell, you could also limit this. You could say, uh, uh, three slash day. So it doesn't get out of hand with just constantly, um, throwing out the other spells that it has on itself. Um, lost my page there. Um. And the Minotaur glows uh, bright light in a uh, uh, 30 foot radius for uh, until the start of its next turn. So w the Minotaur should have dark vision, right? Um, but when it casts a spell, there will be a flash and a glow. And that way it will come on and off. Um, the Minotaur will constantly create this light as it's casting spells. Uh, and that, uh, it could also be in the spell steal section. You know, one of them could cause the light that's changing the light levels of the battlefield and kind of um, giving this uh, Shadow Paladin, not to say difficult decisions, strategic decisions aren't difficult, they're just interesting, but giving the Paladin interesting decisions as you've got these flashes of uh, light that eliminate the shadows until the uh, start of the Minotaur's next turn. Um, I wouldn't do that on Bloodcast, actually, because um, then it, the Minotaur would just do it every round and we'd just basically have... Um, we just basically have no light, or sorry, we would have no shadows because the Minotaur would do it every round for three rounds. That's how Bloodcast would probably work. 
Uh, I would do it, and the Minotaur glows bright in a third raised, something like that. Uh, alternatively, you could do Blood Cast as a recharge. Um, I would go recharge four to six. They should do it more often. Um, uh, every second round, essentially. Um, then you could then you could move back the the glow back to this because it's not going to happen every turn. And then it kind of gives the sometimes the Shadow Paladin has shadows near the Minotaur. Sometimes the Shadow Paladin can only go far away or uh, jump through it. Um, Okay, so we have um, uh, the light comes from that too, like seared on him. I love that too, yeah. Um, for the mirror's eyes glow whenever he's looking, no shadows. Ryan, that's a great one. That's a great one. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, you're probably planning that one for your paladin itself. Use that on one of your monsters. Uh, we don't, you know, Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have facing rules, um, and it's a little cleaner without it. But might as well use facing rules, you know. Have a monster with that cone, kind of like the Beholder's uh, anti magic cone, a cone of light. And you uh, have it pointed in certain directions that it moves um, as, uh, during your battle. I think that's an excellent one to use. Um, great suggestion for your for your own for your own character. I believe there yours was the Shadow Paladin. Um, so uh, as I'm as I'm wrapping up here, uh, I can't go too late, but I can go a little bit longer. If anyone has um, questions about this or about generic uh, gaming advice, I can kind of do some rapid fire uh, advice or tips. I think that's a great thing to end on is a few dm questions guidance questions design questions adventure design monster design if your questions are about monsters excellent if they're not about monsters still excellent i can kind of rapid fire you some fire you some answers and we'll uh we'll cover that topic um, um and um while any of you are possibly thinking of questions i can say um uh you know be sure to uh, if you're watching this video later or on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. If you're watching this live on Twitch, be sure to follow Goodman Games. Uh, you can also check out my uh, Twitch channel. Um, I was uh, I was thinking of making a little promotion. Like if I get if I get 100 followers on my Twitch channel, I'll start a second uh, 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 bi-weekly show that runs on the other, the opposite Sundays. Currently, I'm not streaming from my Twitch channel, which is GM Ben Show, uh, which I uh, have put in the chat a little earlier. Um, if I get, uh, yeah, I was thinking if I get 100 followers on my Twitch channel, it will take a while, it'll take a while, but that will, if I get 100 followers, that'll spur me, I'll start for the second show. Until then, I would not really stream on that show, because here I am on the Goodman Games Twitch channel, which you, if you want to catch me, you should follow Goodman Games. Uh, if you want more info, more content that I produce, uh, I put some free gaming rules quite frequently on my Twitter, follow me at GMBen on Twitter. Um, uh, Ryan says, uh, when you run, what's your approach to monster hit HP? Do you roll every time, use an average or something else? Ryan, I can say that I um, almost always use an average. Uh, the I, uh, I modify monsters regularly, and I often just use an existing stat block. And my players uh, can't really predict what the hit points will be before the fight. Once they've fought one or two of them, they tend to know the hit points exactly uh, because I don't roll. Uh, I just make it easier on myself. Uh, however, um, only like one of my players is actually tracking monster hit points and kind of predict when they're going to fall. I, I use the old fourth edition. Oh, they're below half health. I can say you've now drawing blood. They're bloodied when they're below half health. I just give that cue. So most of my players aren't following um, uh, so directly. And I use average hit points. Doesn't uh, doesn't worry me about any kind of versimilitude. It's, it's, it honestly it kind of creates a standardized appearance. And then specifically, as I was saying earlier, if I'm having a monster die a little early, I have learned, and I probably only as a DM picked this up in 5th edition in the last uh, couple of years, I have learned don't up its hit points, don't make the fight last longer, don't turn the fight into a slog, unless it's truly your big bad evil guy you want the fight take all session. That's the case, up its hit points. Otherwise, up its damage. Make the fight scarier by having a sudden hit that it drives damage into your players. That will catch things. Uh, I'm curious, Almanger says, I know I jumped in late, so ignore me if this is already discussed, but how are you tracking shadows for the Paladin? Like, have you homebrewed uh, ray tracing rules to find a shadow of a given tree? Uh, Ryan, that's a question for uh, you. Uh, that is, uh, the Shadow Paladin was um, uh, one of the players, one of the characters suggested to us by uh, someone in the chat. It came from Ryan Immel. And um, it, if you like Ryan Immel's ideas, do check out Ryan Immel's stream. Click through to uh, Ryan's account where uh, he also runs session prep. Or for, sorry, a form of session prep uh, show. And, um, uh, but that, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think the sh a Shadow Monk uh, ha monk subclass has a similar ability where dim light is required. Um, but are you going to draw that on the grid? Is a, <laughs> it's a great question. And how often do you draw it on the grid? Um, and Ryan says, I've been trying to push myself to do something new, everyone in combat. Uh, 
Absolutely. I would say to new Dungeon Masters, uh, think of one twist for combat. One, and so if you're not off to Dungeon Master, listen to the stream. Uh, Ryan tries to do something new every round of combat. I would say try to do one thing new. Something to really flip the fight on its head. Something new comes in. It's the reinforcements arrive is the most straightforward example. The battlefield changes. The floor opens. Something at the midpoint is a great little addition to a fight. Instead of just upping the monster's hit points, change the battlefield. Um, bring in reinforcements, perhaps. Um, uh, okay. Um, I think that's uh, all the questions for the end of this stream, bringing me to uh, the end of our overtime. Uh, don't forget to uh, like, follow, and subscribe. And uh, as always, have a good session.